Hey, everybody. So welcome to the next uh, formal mutations book club. This one is on William Irwin Thompson's Coming Into Being, Artifacts and Texts in the Evolution of Consciousness. Uh, this one is a, is definitely a favorite of mine, and I think part of the uh, literary DNA of mutations and, and really my own writing and work. I think I probably visited and revisited Thompson's work dozens of times as I was working on seeing uh, through the world and many times as I've been working on fragments as a sort of literary inspiration. Uh, his uh, description of mind jazz uh, is, is uh, one of those. Is the audio coming through okay, okay or is it doing the thing again? Okay, good, good. Um, yes, yeah, his, his style, literary style of mind jazz and his approach of Vishenkunst or, or knowledge art has always been deeply inspirational for me. It's It's been a, um, a, a template and a model and uh, a context and a framework just to continue to revisit, uh, especially as mutations moves forward into, uh, as many of us are going to be hearing about in the in the coming weeks and months, a, a new a new era. Uh, lots of new possibilities are opening up, and um, not just the in terms of courses and, and book clubs, but uh, some other some other work kind of moving outside of the book club, uh, moving outside of the the Zoom call discussion into perhaps brick and mortar events, um, organizing in person for things, and then also maybe some organizational structure that is sort of in planning stages right now, but fomenting and very exciting. Um, and, you know, the, the first, uh, really the first inspiration I thought of as those possibilities were opening up was, oh, I need to go back to, to, to build Thompson's work and think about Linda's Farn Association and uh, what we could actually do together. Um, yeah, I see Danny saying, uh, just beginning the book, but watched it, uh, watched interviews, read Bruce Clark's interview with Thompson. Yeah, that's a good interview. Um, Thompson is one of these folks that is, is like criminally underappreciated in our communities, uh, like criminally almost. Like we should give people citations for, for not, <laughs> not reading Bill, Bill's work. Uh, it completely has flown under the radar, even into today. Like I, I would say on the periphery, on the edges for folks who knew Thompson, like Michael Garfield and Future Fossils or Mitch Mignano, or you know, maybe Daniel Pinchbeck's work has sort of referenced him on the edges and now Bruce Clark's work in a more academic context. But um, yeah, I've just found that folks don't know his work and they really should. Uh, Coming Into Being is probably the single most recommended text that I do in terms of like where to get started, in terms of where I suggest folks can actually begin. It's here because especially folks who've read Wilbur or who have read a lot of other contemporary scholarship on consciousness evolution, this gives you a taste of what Gepser's like. This gives you a taste of what Barfield is like. Uh, this really gets you saturated into uh, the kind of style that you need in order to engage Gepser's work successfully, like in terms of engaging with art and poetry and literature and myth and weaving that all into a discussion that is at the same time intellectual, poetic, mystical. Thompson does that, and he has a very different style than Gebser, obviously. Uh, very much the Irish bardic, um, almost a kind of a, again, a literary performance. There, there's yes. a sort of stream of consciousness uh, element here in the Joycean way, where the connections as you're reading that Thompson makes between, uh, I don't know, um, the spirochetes of Lynn Margulis and uh, the literature of Proust and the emergence of the self, right? Like this, the connections that he's able to make in, in many aspects of this book are fantastic. And you'll see that in all of his other writing. Um, and it's a good, this text itself is a really good place to begin with Thompson because it's kind of looking back. It's looking back to the 80s and the collaborations with the Lindisfarne Association. Uh, Thompson, like like Gebser was befriending these folks who he felt were uh, expressing some new mode of thinking, particularly what Thompson called you know, planetary thinking or planetary culture. Uh, he was talking with folks like Lynn Margulis, right? Biologist, microbiologist, um, Francisco Maturana, uh, Wendell Berry, the poet, and uh, E.F. Schumacher as well. So, so there was economists, ecologists, scientists, philosophers of mind. And Thompson's unique gift was really uh, 
you know, he, he, if you read this book, you might get the impression he's a bit of a Luddite, but at the same time, he himself was so prescient as an individual who was able to weave together disciplines in a transdisciplinary way, right? He was doing that kind of network thinking that I think has really come into more into the fore today. Uh, he, was, he was a thinker for our time. He, he was a literary essayist for the internet age. You would probably despise that, but if I, if I, if you heard me say that, but, uh, there's something about his style that is very much in that spirit of our times. Uh, so I, yes, I recommend this text because it's a good summation of the work he did in collaboration with these other writers and thinkers. And the point that I made in my, uh, my newsletter was, it's another good example of this combinatorial creativity. You see the influences that Thompson's drawing from, the friendships and fellowship that he was drawing from in order to think the way he was thinking. Um, and it's also a good summation, I think, of his general model of consciousness evolution. You see how the, the working of uh, James Lovelock and Gaia Hypothesis with Lynn Margulis really helped him begin to think with the planet and contextualize the evolution of human consciousness in relation to our embodied relationship with the planet, whether we're talking about earlier societies that he called were riverine, right? And then he attaches that with this arithmetic mentality, the, the flowing of the rivers and the lists and the stories and mnemonic memory, right? Um, onto the more uh, geometric forms and structures that we see in, in, in larger uh, civilizations, onto, again, the oceanic cultures of the industrial nation states. So there's always a sense that one is in relationship with the planet, no matter what one is doing or thinking in terms of the context of human, human societies. And now, of course, with planetization, um, it's, it's a bit more atmospheric. It's, it's the Gaian context that we're in and situated in. Um, so yeah, one immediately gets a sense of being grounded in relation with the more than human, with the with the planetary, right, um, with the bioregional, and then Thompson's probably you know his unique gift being a cultural historian is the weaving in of all of this great history with folklore and myth, uh, and the connections he makes are quite brilliant. There's one other book I would love for us to read together, uh, maybe this summer, maybe later on, called uh, Imaginary Landscape, and that one. It's probably the, the best example. It's a short text, uh, but there's a particular essay in there uh, doing something similar to what he does in this book, where he is able to weave together Rudolf Steiner and his esoteric cosmology with uh, the, the, the thinking of Lynn Margulis. And basically, uh, I wouldn't exactly say he literalizes the myth because he, he hates that. And he always talks about how a lot of folks tend to do that, especially with ancient alien, ancient alien hypotheses and all that. Uh, but he's able to weave together Steiner's esoteric cosmology to say like here, Steiner is talking about the same thing that Margulis is talking about with the evolution of the planet and uh, uh, the movement from uh, um, the early life, right? Which was, um, uh, what did you call it? Anaerobic towards uh, aerobic bacteria. It was a kind of an usurpation. And he weaves all of this together in the myth and the folktale of Rapunzel, uh, which then he weaves again into the, this movement from the movement from a matriarchy to patriarchy and the evolution of culture. He does it all in a sing single chapter, wonderfully woven together. So there's a kind of exquisiteness in, in Thompson's writing that um, I've, I've really not found in other writers in our field. Uh, a pretty unique and singular gift here. So that being said, I want to I want to open it up, and before I keep rambling. I want to hear our impressions, particularly, okay, um, two, two framings set to, to, to get started. One, if you've not read Thompson before, and this is sort of your first engagement with his work, or perhaps your first serious engagement, uh, what your initial impressions are in, in engaging with this text. And two, if you're returning, like what, what, what is striking you about this, this reading this time around? What's kind of coming to the fore? Because I have my own thoughts on that, but I would love to hear how some of us are experiencing this book. So yeah, feel free to just raise your hand. Um, we're a small enough group that we could just jump into, but, uh, oh, here we go, we got Bill. And then I think maybe Sandy after. Yeah, Connie. Oh, Bill, uh, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that, yeah. Um, one thing I feel about Thompson is that um, and that's really amazing about him that I haven't found in anybody else is that he um, his ideas really come forward spontaneously. I mean, he's he's basically a speaker. 
And I think he says that about this book, that it was originally, you know, the lectures given in New York and uh, Cathedral of uh, St. John the Divine, I think, um, I don't remember, but, um, and then what he does is then he, he goes over the ideas and then puts them into a book. But I think that is what's so amazing is that it, it's all coming out intuitively. Of course, he's read so much and has had, has vast experience, but, um, it's not coming out, you know, much through the the uh, left side of the brain. It's it's really a a right hemisphere uh, approach, and um, that that he could do this so well, um, I think, gives us all hope that that if we uh, trusted the process, <laughs> you know, and and of course, if we had a certain amount of knowledge and experience, then. Um, you know, we we could do it ourselves, but uh, I don't think most of us believe that we can, and therefore we've never uh, followed his path of you know mind jazz and and knowledge art. It just seems too difficult. He's one of a kind. Yeah. Well, that's that's my reaction. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Bill. Um, I definitely agree that there's a sense, you know, maybe maybe the work of Terence McKenna. Uh, but not 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 McKenna's writing, uh, another Irish, uh, but uh, another Irishman. But uh, certainly the the the, or, the oral and auditory element of Thompson is very present in the text. It's very clear. And um, if folks don't know, there's a thing called uh, the Lindisfarne tapes. It's a website that archives a lot of the, um, not a lot, but a few years worth of the presentations by Thompson and others at the Lindisfarne. Uh, gatherings and you could you just listen to thompson in his prime you know in the 70s and, and really get a sense of that bardic quality that just sort of flows out of him uh again i i've i've in, in, encountered thompson as a role model for myself I'm just like oh, i wish i could do that um but uh it's it's good though i think it's um i don't, I don't think we're quite there yet either uh we're much more open and receptive i think culture is now to transdisciplinarity, uh, but it's not even quite that. It's it's closer to um, the the concept that Neri Oxman popularized of of uh, the anti discipline, anti disciplinarity in the sense of just jumping over the walls of the disciplines and making the connections that, let's say, the right side of the brain want to make and moving forward with that uh, as needed. Um, I think as as a practice, I, I wish more of us would do that. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm definitely here for that. I'm definitely here for that for for furthering that along in our fields. But yeah, thanks, Bill. Sandy, you want to jump in? Well, I actually want to reflect to you, Jeremy, that I think you are. I I see his influence in you in your presentations um, and the. Um, the we've talked about this before there's a sense of the blend of this incredible level of knowledge because i think that's the key that sort of level of understanding that really is and comes out of the academia um but is not taught to do in fact the opposite right you don't do what bill does or what you do um but there's definitely this stretching happening and i see it in you which is that um um bringing presence bringing presence talk about sort of trying to like manifest a dynamic of origin because um in academia you know that's not what you're taught to do and it's so much about it is so much about the left brain and proving something or and the the dynamic of the flow um comes from a grounded sense of presence and a sort of letting go of like i have to be proving something to this you know it's a going outside of the parameters um that are that are allowed uh so i just want to tell you i really see it in you not only see it in you you know i hear it in you and i feel it in you i think it's one of the power that that you bring forth here is your your the dynamic of the knowledge that you have and you have that sort of weave of many different um, focuses but brought into a place coming from heart and soul and um, that that that's that's I think what what he's modeling, and I really want to affirm that I do feel that with you. So I really appreciate that. 
one other thing I wanted to reflect on, I have many things to reflect on, but I'll just talk about one thing right now is, you know, what Thompson's, what's really interesting, he talks about the concept of like, there's different texts from different uh, structures of consciousness, he calls them something else, that are representative of different uh, phases of a co of consciousness. So there's, there's one called a formative text, so there's three texts, one is sort of, here's what's coming. Here's a story that's reflective of what is emerging. And then there's two other texts. But for what I feel is just kind of stretching it. I feel like that coming into being is a formative text, very much a formative text. And it reflects sort of formative texts aren't really well known when they're coming forth because they're formative. The consciousness that really can embrace what the meaning and the, and the impact of the formative text material is just starting. So that's the irony of it. And so it sort of starts kind of slow and then kind of burgeons up as the as the as the consciousness manifests or the shift comes. And then it just resonates with like incredible potency around the meaning because it's not quite there yet. But what's interesting is looking at this book, which is written in the 90s, and how like you know, if you have any question, the level of his analysis of the today is so prescient and so right on, and this is decades ago. And so just in terms of that, his, his depth understanding of the unfolding processes that are happening and, and the projected and the projected what they're going to continue, which he was right about. And this is the very beginning of the internet too. And to me, that's like, okay, this is a, this is this is a formative text, but it's not just like, okay, yeah, he's getting right how the the um, the disintegration of of our of our current structure is manifesting. But what I find is really important, and I hope we can talk about a little bit today or maybe in the future, is what he's look what he's coming forth as what he sees will be the thing to focus on, what we can do, what are the what lessons we've learned from looking at all the different different manifestations of consciousness and his understanding of Gebser. I feel like he really gets Gebser and he applies it in his own way of like, okay, what is it about the magical and the mythical and the mental that we need to be bringing forth in terms of integral? And he has lots of, he throws it in in all kinds of interesting ways of like, here's what he's bringing forth in terms of what what we want to be embodying. So when we've talked about our doing GEPs or our GEPs or lab, I think that Thompson has a lot of very interesting points to make about manifesting what what GEPs would call the integral. So I hope we can have some dialogue about that as well. Yeah, I think that that's probably worth its own discussion even as well. I mean, certainly start it here, but I think this is something uh, going forward, weaving in Thompson with Gebser in our discussions and maybe even dedicating a few discussions this summer, I was thinking of having, um, you know, Michael Garfield's going to be doing a course with us as well, uh, this summer on, uh, um, Jurassic worlding and, uh, you know, his, his backgrounds on, he was a paleontologist and an artist for a while and he was going to do paleontology art anyway. Um, interesting, um, weaving together of deep time and science and art, et cetera. And, uh, I just think it would be great to have um, Michael on in discussion. I can, I can think of a few other folks maybe to weave in. Folks either knew Thompson or are working with Thompson's work as well that just would be really great co-hosts for that kind of discussion. Uh, so planning a few of those this summer. Um, and just as a quick note too, before we keep moving, I know we got, which is great. I love to see everyone's hands raised and, and engaged here. Um, Particularly the the analysis, and you see this maybe more in the American Replacement of Nature, which is an, another text from the '90s. Uh, but the, the chapter in coming into being about uh, the Ramayana, the evolution of consciousness with technology and magic, is just oof, that one really hits home powerfully today. Um, and that's chapter where is it? It's like right towards the end. Um, yeah, the, yep. the the listen to the title of this. Some of these chapter titles are just their own uh, catalytic uh, fragments. The alliance of the animal and the human, and the expulsion of the demonic from the physical world. A consideration of the Ramayana. 
uh, that one in particular, it was just quite a wild ride to, to, to move through. Again, weaving of technology, myth, magic, yeah. evolution of consciousness, thinking about one dark age and then thinking about our own yeah. information age um, and how this is sort of where Thompson is sort of premising the, the whole text. He's really saying we're entering a dark age right now. We're in a, a transitional period from uh from nation states from globalization towards planetization and in that there's all of this noise and breakdown right where we're trying to find new and he's he's drawing from his his work um with uh ralph abraham chaos you know uh, chaos science chaos mathematics chaotic attractors etc to make these analogies but um i was really struck by that that line and, and you know he's a little he's a little sharp right he's a little grumpy he could be a little mean spirited yeah. in his writing and and it, yeah. i just i've gotten so used to it but i know that that's definitely um he's not playing nice uh he's got a bit of an attitude but the line on like page three where he's saying if ted turner's cnn is the rich white trash's network for the poor why shouldn't the poor white trash come up with their own aryan nation news with its reports that the united nations is planning to invade northern michigan and the cia blew up the federal building in oklahoma city and i immediately thought of the kind of um, news stations that we have today, actually, that have gone further right than Fox News, that have their own narratives about we're being invaded by the woke. So, so there's this kind of collapse of, of, of solid ground that he was speaking to, even back then, in a very prescient way. Um, and yes, he's very curmudgeon about about our our time. And I think for me, um, we'll get into this later. But just engaging with his work as a young person who wanted to be more optimistic and and. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. wide-eyed about it and, and having such a curmudgeon mentor it was actually good for me I think it's sort of like I've been inoculated with enough like bullshit detection so as I get older I'm starting to appreciate that that side of, of, of Bill um, yeah. but anyway yeah let me let me jump to uh, Connie if yeah. that's okay and we'll, we'll circle back around it's called snarky he's very snarky yeah <laughs> yeah and, and I like Snarkiness it is, yeah. jabs and human yeah interesting thanks Andy yeah, Connie, if you'd like to jump in. Yeah, um, so I just I just came up with a couple of things while I was reading them, and of course I can't uh, I can't find it right now. Um, that that I would like for us to sort of discuss. And one was when he was talking about um, the rate the the raising rate of suicide, uh, especially among young people. When he was talking about that, and and you know you can't help but notice the datedness of the book because this was completely pre mass murder um so you know that there's an extension of the extended rate of suicide and how the suicide um temptation or the suicide energy now seems to be preceded by and let me take a few people out with me um so i'm wondering about the the mythology you know i'm just wondering what he would say about that and he may have said something. i mean he didn't he only died four or five years ago right so he may have said something that i never heard but there's that and then the other is that more than anybody else who's ever who i've ever read who's written about uh, marshall McLuhan, he really gets marshall McLuhan. And um, so I think even those of us uh, who, who may not have read Marshall McLuhan, I think as a group, we could really benefit from a discussion about Marshall McLuhan through the eyes of, of how Thompson describes him. So those are just two things I hope we can talk about. Yeah, wow. Uh, that first one, I, I can't recall offhand if, if anybody else who's read Thompson can think of the relevant connections he was making about uh, mass shootings. Um, I, I've drawn more from his his discussion around, I, I would actually check out the American replacement of nature for an exploration of that. And there's there's a way in which the um, the framing here is, I guess I would have appreciated a little bit more subtlety, uh, and I think it's still very prescient. But the way Thompson talks about how there's these sort of uh, in McLuhan-esque retrievals of previous social organization bands and tribes and cults and um, reacting to planetization, uh, I, I think you know the distinctions that we've made here in this group, and then I've made in my own work that you know globalization itself becomes a kind of a a toxic enclosure that a lot of a lot of groups start retreating into other polities from right and we have like the mass murder 
uh, which sort of attempts to create some kind of like mo blip or, or momentary blip. They often write in a manifesto. They often are associated with some kind of belief about society, right? They kind of, uh, the, there's a kind of violence, but there's also a kind of a self-assertion that seems to be happening there as the self is being dissolved in, in globalization that I think he'd probably find something interesting to say about. Um, so yeah, just just on that note too, and totally about McLuhan. I think we should we should definitely do a, a, a Gepster McLuhan session. Andrew McLuhan is is open for it. Uh, we've talked a couple of times about doing something, and I, I think we will end up doing something, uh, especially as mutations moves into its sort of uh, re, re envisioning over the next couple of months, uh, and we have more more programming. So definitely look forward to that as well, and then also invite that here for this discussion. Yeah, thanks, Connie. Uh, Carrie, hey, good to see you. Oh, not sure if your uh, connection's good right now. Is there you go. That me? <laughs> okay, Hello. you're, you're, you're um, coming. Exactly there the you wrong go. time. Cool, great. I love the idea of the anti-disciplinary, um, so I'll be looking into that a lot. Um, but this was my first reading of this writer, and I didn't necessarily agree with everything they had to say, um, but even when I didn't, I loved reading them. I loved their style. I love how they approach things. It really, um, I really vibed with how they write and how they think. It it was very natural for me to read them because I think that's how I naturally think. Um, maybe not that well or that quickly or that um, that slickly, but um, my goodness, was it natural for me to process information in that way? Um, I disagree with them about gender. Um, their idea of women as being naturally soft and gentle and lovely. He clearly never went to an all girls school. <laughs> Um, but um, what I particularly uh, love so far, a third of the way through the book, is um, telling more than we know. And I, th I think that's what he's doing. He's thinking at the very brink of his ability and listing that he can package things in a disciplinary way. Um, and that's allowing him to communicate more than he would do if he was communicating in a more um, traditional academic way. And I love that. I'm also very intrigued by what he's saying about cathedrals of light. That's very G.J. Ballard. That's very Redding Graham Dempsey. I want to know what his cathedral is like. Um, but most of all, I, regardless of whether or not I end up agreeing with him, overall, I don't know yet. Um, just to approach writing is Yes, extraordinary. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Uh, you're chopping up a little bit at the end there, but I, I think I heard you say his approach to writing is extraordinary. I think I heard heard everything else. Um, totally agree with you. Uh, some of his writing about uh, gender and women, he got pushed back even in his own time by um, feminist scholarship, etc. And he was, I think, too grumpy to. to listen to good criticism so yeah. um you know definitely there's definitely things to disagree with in some of thompson's writing uh particular biases that come through um but yes i just I completely agree that the, the the style this mind jazz approach to to it's not just doing a so I don't know if anyone's listened to Overthink podcast recently. They're, they're a podcasting philosophy duo. I really appreciate them. They see their work as academics with a public facing podcast as translators. They, they describe themselves as translating academic work to a general audience. It's sort of a pedagogical element to it, but not necessarily contributing in, in uh, contributing to literature, contributing to public thinking, more of uh, you know just sort of attempting to make it more accessible um, again, an act as a translator. I don't think Thompson was doing that in his role as a public intellectual writing these texts. He's doing something genuinely creative as a work of, uh, and he calls this a literary essay. He understood himself to be of the old guard. And um, there's an interesting talk where he does, 
he's giving a, a book talk and a book lecture circuit for uh, the American replacement of nature. And apparently Howard Rheingold at the time um, was pushing back against Thompson writing these literary essays about technology and magic in America um, by saying, well, the literary essay is not an appropriate form for uh, to talk about the internet and digital culture. And Thompson strongly disagreed with that. He believed the literary essay is a sort of a creative act um, could respond back to the digital age, respond back to the blog posts and the digital forum, et cetera, um, and really engage with the new medium and in, in itself transform. So I think mind jazz is a great example of how literature can continue to uh, mutate, right, in response. And the old medium, it may not be a kind of environment that we're all saturated in, but the text, the literary text as an art form may become a, a powerhouse organelle in this new electronic body that we're participating in. So sort of the morphological transformations that 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 happen. At, yeah. Um, so anyway, just, just affirming that I think literature, Thompson's a great example of how literature definitely is here to stay um, in an age of electronic media. I think it's absolutely essential that um, that that is an approach that is used because otherwise um, things if there is a I think as a poet I see increasingly a divide between even say sociology and poetry um, or um, the almost the hard humanities uh, let alone the sciences and art as though art um, is somehow this futile thing and you can say anything you like because it doesn't matter and also um that the sciences and maths that people are cut off from those that they cannot think about them or talk about them in their own language and in their own thoughts that they're very um very cut off um they're somewhere over there they have to be over here because otherwise uh, it becomes very undemocratic and we lose um the ability to steer ourselves culturally and um increasingly we are being steered technologically and if we can't do that um in an integrated way we're going to uh go terribly off course i think yeah, to, to that point, you know, uh, before we jump to, to Danny, the, the the line about the cathedrals of light. Yeah, you're right. Very, very Brendan Graham Dempsey in that in that image. Um, but I think that's on uh, page 10 where he's describing that right in the opening where he's saying, you know, we have made normalcy, normalcy non-viable. So we have opted for an up or out scenario in cultural evolution. We either shift upward to a new culture of higher spirituality to turn our electronic technologies into cathedrals of light. Or we slide downward to darkness and entropy in a war of each against all. So, so yeah, he comes to that again and again. This image of cathedrals of light, um, uh, and elsewhere, I think he talks about this as well, right? Like we, um, yeah, uh, our level of consciousness has now become the biggest obstruction to the continuity of human existence. Um, and there's this sense that the technologies that we're weaving and wielding need an intensification of consciousness to use them appropriately. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean to have cathedrals of light? I don't know. We may we may have to investigate some of his poetry for for that inquiry too. Um, yeah, but thank you, thank you, Carrie. Great thoughts. Uh, Danny, I'd like to jump in. Oh, I'm not on mute. Oh my goodness. Uh, so my my vantage point is not having read him and prior and yet getting the history, realizing that so many of the people that went to Lindisfang were people that I pursued, you know, uh, Bateson and every one of those names, somehow Aldous Huxley, you know, those very early ones, they were the ones that lit up something in me coming from a culture that was not that. What, I'm, what I wanna bring in here is, the experience I'm having from listening to these interviews, especially where he's really um, delineating all the people that he meet, met, all the decisions he made about whether to go to MIT, what, whether or not to engage in media, right? He said he did one, what was it, uh, Bill Moyers interview and then said, I'm not doing that anymore. The... Another thing that I heard, and this is where I feel it relates to us, that's what I'm getting to, is um, where he 
it's like finding the place of Lindisfarne in the culture. So it's this interaction with the culture, right? Cathedral lights, exactly what we're talking about. What Carrie just said is, are we talking about, are we going to Lind Lindis another Lindisfarne to talk about something that's over there? Or is it over here for culture, right? For the culture that's here. So what I'm aware of is what a, what a gift to be able to view all of the beauty that he has to offer and that he brought together and all the bridging through in this time capsule. We, we can now see, whoa, this is what was happening in 70s and 80s. And this is how he fit into it and how it's rippled out. And we're here, right? What is it? And so I was starting to think of what is it that he he that there is to learn from his it's mind jazz but it's culture jazz as well i mean there is some way in which these are all people that wanted to interact with the culture wanted to make a difference wanted something to change right and we can now look from this time vantage right They all went about it differently, right? The Stuart brands and the, you know, the whole earth cap. What can we learn? Oh, there's another line that he said, this is in one of the interviews with, what's the, the fellow that you know, is it, did you say Garfield? I forgot his name, the young. Yeah, that's right, Mark, Michael Garfield, Garfield yeah. Where, where um, Thompson says, you know, um, he said, I'm not sure that what's needed is a Linden Spheres now, now anymore. You know, the calming together, sitting in Green Gulch Farm or wherever, that somehow it's spread out more than it is in the academic or it is who knows where he, he was. He was not so certain that it was about bringing together people, bridging without without it somehow being out in the culture. Right. Which is what we're all playing with. And and. Um, it, you know, it's what Sandy said, you know, what do we do, right? And my response, Sandy, was, is like, what can we do? That, that's always the question that you keep hearing after everyone speaks, right? But it's like, how do we go about that doing, right? And from what, it's like, from what, from where do we go about? And that to me feels very much like Thompson, from where he was coming from, why he could not care about academia and care about it and do that he could move around he didn't you know there's the Gepsarian right he didn't need he there's some line where he says something about his radar would go off and he would go mm, no have to spread out so it's from where that I'm asking the question whenever we communicate whatever each one of us does where we're interacting with the culture, from where are we doing that? So trying that out. <laughs> That's great. That's great, Danny. Thank you. Um, yeah, I remember at the time uh, getting excited about that. And because uh, Thompson was saying the same thing to me, I don't remember if he said it in that interview, uh, but this, this idea that well, we don't need Linda's farms, we don't need counterfoil, counterfoil institutions anymore. Um, mm. And I, I, I don't know. I, I think you know, the internet has really, the digital age has, has almost made that, um, uh, it's no longer a, a binary that exists. It, there are simply many different organizations and nodes doing many different things, competing for our attention, um, plugged into the zeitgeist, um, creating and spinning their own narratives and articulating their own version of the future. Right, future imaginaries, possible futures. And I, I think in terms of institutional structures that there is a bit more flexibility, there is a, a more of an openness to the, the, the counterfoil institute kind of being an organelle within the institutional cell. Um, but also there's all of this distribution, right? I think distribution yes. and decentralization is another. So my, my pushback with Thompson in my own head and in our conversations is always, well, what about the, 
the, the, the decentralization of these institutes, what is possible now? Where do we, how do we enact a Linda's farm today in a different way, in a way that maybe is more networked and maybe isn't all of us just hanging out together and, um, as, as much as I love the idea. And I think it's actually, it continues to be a function that I, I feel is important. Um, coming together, but maybe more actively or agentically pushing for uh, or, or acting towards um, accessible works that contribute to the social imaginary that actually help develop this planetary imaginary. Um, I don't know what that will look like exactly, but I, I don't want to, I want to appreciate Thompson's historical Lindisfarne Association, acknowledge his contributions, acknowledge the context that we're in today, and say that there is room for that context to maybe be repurposed in new ways. Uh, but I'm not sure what that is yet. I think it's a grand experiment. Um, because we, we have a lot of, um, you know, just, I've been looking at this today, like there's, there's so many different institutes and nonprofits in our own circles that are, are, are think tanks, essentially, and are attempting to have some kind of influence on culture. And I don't know, are they important? Or are they, are they not important? Should they be folded into larger institutions? Or um, I think there's an interesting tension and dance there, I guess is what I'm saying. And our place in it as um, early explorers, formative text, bearers and creators of planetary culture. Uh, th there's, some, there's something interesting that we have to work on here in this space. And it's not quite clear yet what that is, but I do think it's important to keep coming together. Um, as I uh, recently, sorry, this is just an aside, but uh, some of you know uh, Rhea Bach's work on collective presencing, of course, we've, we've adapted a lot of that for doing Gepser to Gepser and the, and the Gepser courses this year. Um, there's a sense that as I was reading Thompson recently this past week, getting ready for today, uh, I almost see Lindisfarne as a kind of uh, collective presencing of, of intellectuals and poets, right? There is a circle of, of thinkers and they're coming from all these different fields. And the middle, the middle is where Thompson was drawing his inspiration from and also contributing his work towards. And you could see that in his work and the reason why we look to Lindisfarne now, because there's a kind of... Um, collective intelligence or genius and the the networked relation between the Margulises and the Stegans and the Schumachers and and the Berries, uh, there's something there that arises in between. Uh, it, it may not need to be an elite like retreat house uh, setting, but um, you know maybe it could be a more distributed event these days, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. But the middle is still there. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't want to lose sight of that middle space. That's so interesting. It's both a spiritual practice, but also a template for um, catalyzing culture, right? Or at least that's my, that's what I'm advocating for. Uh, does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think you know, helping us to notice again what these elements might be, because it, it it's really because, and and just when you said that, having the center. It doesn't mean that there isn't all that mycorrhizal and whatever that happening, but but also the food that comes from the center. And um, the one word I want to bring in to uh, that fits with that um, anti-disciplinary versus cross-disciplinary is the Gebsarian sense that I have, and I don't know if he ever used the word, but porousness, the porosity. And I've been feeling that more and more, and that's how I'm beginning to answer my own question of the how. How do we interact with people that have had no contact with Gebser? Have, you know, I, that's why I'm interested, the, the Overthink, right? The Overthink podcast, when you say that, they are being willing to, there's a, 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 a way to be both the people that have never heard about it and the people that are, are right there wrapped in the center. What, what does that mean, right? That's, yeah, it's 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 a very lovely. That means it's here, right? Both people, the listener and the presenter, are both here in that middle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the what we're speaking to as well as is um, what Carrie was speaking to, but we tell more than we know. That uh, that culture is always telling more than it knows. Uh, that that the the stories are that our media and our our cultural imagination are weaving and, and spinning and dreaming every single day and year and, and decade, uh, 
reflect back to us something about ourselves, what we are, what transformations, what tensions we're undergoing. And so really the whole, the whole of culture becomes both the, the, the object of analysis for us. And then also the, we are participants in this creation and it's spinning. So there's also the artist who participates, but also as a scientist and observes themselves. So there's a really interesting dance going on there. And I think this is, this is the, some of the, the, the consilience between Gepser and, and Thompson, for instance, between Gepser's cultural phenomenology or, or cultural philosophy and T uh, Thompson's cultural, uh, yeah, sorry, cultural philosophy for Gebser and Thompson's cultural phenomenology. And Thompson would refer to Gebser as a cultural phenomenologist of like, of like mind. So yeah, what, what do we tell more than we know and how can that speak to us more about what's going on presently with culture, consciousness, evolution, et cetera, the sense of self. Um, this, is our, this is our medium that we as artists, scholars work with. And it really opens up different possibilities for us to really continue to engage in, in ways that maybe Linda's farm uh, was doing and, and had more potential to do. Maybe we can explore that. I love this as a question. What can we do, as, as Bill's saying, um, his network did not realize his full potential because he always had to do fund fundraising. Um, what can we do today that might be different? I think is an interesting question. How do we take that and iterate? How do we mutate that? Um, yeah, thank you, Denny. All right, let's jump to, let's jump to Karen. Hey, Karen. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to be here with you all again. Yeah, um, I got, uh, as I said before, I haven't read this book from cover to cover. I'm, I'm doing that now. I, at this point, I got to ch through chapter two, and I'm going to be finishing the rest. My, on my, when Jeremy first turned me on to this book several years ago, thank you, Jeremy, um, I kind of bounced out of chapter one. Uh, just uh, it it didn't it didn't engage my interest, so I kind of skimmed through the remaining chapters and was elated as a cultural historian myself. But I'm finding, wow! Now that I'm sitting down and and doing a disciplined read, really paying attention, it's like wow, wow, wow! Every paragraph. I wanted for for this share, I want to bounce off uh, what Carrie and Sandy said for point A, and then there will be a part two, which is uh, an observation of mine that I wanted to bring with me today. But the question, I mean, what can we do? And of course, we will find new ways of doing and being together. But the question, what will we do, uh, put me right back to what a place I tabbed on page 10. Nothing less than truth, goodness, and a Buddhist universal compassion are going to get us through this transition from industrialization to planetization. And that brings me back to one of my points as a cultural historian on my own. I've come up with my own synthesis, which I am relieved and delighted to see tallies with Gebser and uh, William Irwin Thompson as I'm coming to know them. But we are in a dark, quote, dark age now. We are in a major civilizational transition from one established mode of being on the planet to another new emergent mode. And we have done this six times before, the way I analyze history, I've got this on a spreadsheet, but the periods in between when the next new era is just emerging for the first time tend to be experienced by the people who live through them as periods of breakdown and chaos. They are literally apocalypses. If you read about the apocalypse in the book of Revelation, we've got all four horsemen war, famine, plague, death, the people who live through these eras, and we have historical evidence for three of them, they see this as the breakdown, the end, oh, it's all falling apart. But even as the old structures are breaking down, they're breaking down because new structures are just beginning to emerge. And eventually, after the apocalypse, we have a new heaven and a new and a new earth that which I translate in current terms to say, we have a new order of existence of civilization on the planet and we have new forms of spirituality. So this, this quote of Thompson, nothing less than truth, goodness and a Buddhist universal compassion are going to get us through this transition that we're in right now. So that's one track among many other tracks. There are many very good, very smart, very dedicated people working on the practical sides. And right now I'm thinking of the Institute for Applied Metaphysics that Rob Smith over with the integral people. I mean, these people are experienced and working very, very hard on the institutional uh, business structure, government structure, social structures. There are a lot of wonderful people out there 
doing very good work that doesn't make it into the headlines, right? Because it's good news and it's not sensational. But I noticed that just two sentences after that page passage I just quoted was uh, refers to what Kerry was saying, where Thompson says, we either shift upward to a new culture of a higher spirituality to turn our electronic technologies into cathedrals of light. I love that metaphor. For me, that's a very pregnant metaphor. It's I have my own very elaborate thought structures about what that means and how that integrates technology, spirituality, grounded physical being. I would love to see this group continue to return to this as, as one of the many um, what mental models we're working with. I think that's a very that that is pregnant with possible cathedrals of light. What a beautiful metaphor. And I, I've, I studied medieval cathedrals when I was an art historian. So I know a lot about how they were built and what their structures are and why they differed from earlier things and how they, uh, how they structured the, the solid walls to open up the huge spaces for those windows, those incredible windows like Chart Cathedral, that the light of heaven shines through, but it illuminates the patterns in the windows, which I equate with mental thoughts. Anyway, I could play with that for a long time. So if this group wants to come back to that, this is this I, I I'm I'm just grounding that further in my own um, um, sense of how to move forward. So that was part A of my current verbal, and part B is on page 27. Um, where he's talking about big patterns, basically. In the middle of the page, he was talking with Stuart, I think he was talking with Stuart Kaufman, who was uh, one of the people very involved in you know, the Santa Fe Institute and uh, uh, the, the sciences of chaos and complexity, um, which is how, how, do new, how, how do new emergent things, uh, how do new emergence orders of, of organization exist in an entropic universe. And Stuart Kaufman and the Santa Fe Institute created part of that excitement that, that William Irwin Thompson is so excited about. I was elated when I discovered the sciences of chaos and complexity because it made sense of so many things. But he, uh, uh, William raised the question, he said, he asked in the middle of page 27, he says, he asks Stuart Kaufman this question: What is the ontological status of patterns? Are they principle? Are these principles platonic ideals or mathematical laws? And Stuart Kaufman says, "I don't know." But then, at the bottom of the page, gets to why I'm I'm chewing through this. The bottom of this page is the sensible realms and the intelligible realms, and out of which principles of self-organization from noise allow new modes of being to emerge. And then he goes a few sentences of later, you know, this is the emergent of new orders of organization out of chaos. How does order emerge out of chaos? How have six levels of human society emerged out of each other? How has this universe, how is this earth and these, this solar system and these galaxies we know emerged out of the Big Bang? How does order emerge from chaos? Um, so he's discussing this. And then he says, this is how I understand angels, beings of the intelligible realm whose incarnation is made out of music and math, out of structures of vibration. And then he goes on, actually in the middle of the next page, he talks about cathedrals as one way to do this. But this is my passion, is how do, it, well, it's, it's the big patterns. He's trying, he's looking at the really big patterns that cross all of the, all of the boundaries between areas of human knowledge. What are the really big patterns with which he understand the tendency of an entropic universe to keep creating increasing levels of structure? And this is one of my passions. And I'm, besides which being a cultural historian, I am going to thoroughly enjoy my next romp through all of his Irish bardic presentation of the world's literary history. So that's that's my burble for today. I am loving this. And thank you all for being here and being part of this. Thank you, Karen. Fantastic. Um, I, I love that line too. That really struck me when I uh, had read it many years ago, this idea of uh, incarnation is is not meat, but math, right? And that there's a kind of, it's about the motion, right? It's about the vibration and the pattern, which, sort of, which is the incarnational event, right? Distributed across space and time, across organisms. He mentions, uh, yeah, structures of vibration constellated by molecules, cells, or trees in a forest, or animals in the wild, or human minds in a collectivity one might wish to call after the thinking of Rudolf Steiner, a folk soul. 
if it is tribally embedded in place, or a zeitgeist, if it is more distributively spread over a space, but specific to a time. So one starts to get a, you get the sense of um, uh, how these higher dimensionalities, quote unquote, higher you know, angelic realms might interpenetrate and uh, participate you know, in a very imminent way in the, in the living flesh, right? Through mathematics, pattern, time. Uh, so I just love how uh, Thompson weaves that together so wonderfully as, as, as well. Um, and he brings a lot of that too, when he's talking about the, the vibration of the spirochete in early cells and Margulis, and he's saying, well, maybe there's a kind of Pythagorean chord going on here in a sort of yeah. um, incarnational uh, event happening through that movement that brings forward the self, right? The early self of the cell, right? There's agency in the cell. And he talks quite a bit about that with Margulis's work. And then he links that, of course, to Proust. So I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I can't replicate that bardic um weaving myself but uh it was quite impressed when he, when he put all that together but yes and this yeah, is this fantastic. is real to him as as you know uh to me the high re i i i'm convinced there are more dimensions than three or four or five and to to him the higher dimensions are real and as we we'll, as as we we get into the later parts of the book he's talking about these um what paranormal supernatural beings like angels, they are real to him. He's not just using them metaphorically. He'll talk about rakshasas and, and jinn and so on later in the book. And he can get, he, he gets away with playing the edge. He's doing this bardic thing. Well, is it just being metaphorical or playful or poetic or imaginary? They're, they're real to him and that 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 peeks through and he kind of slides us into it so skillfully because he's playing across such a wide spectrum that we kind of accept him talking about these entities are they really real or are they just like metaphor poetic metaphors he's he plays that edge really brilliantly yes he certainly does yeah thank you karen let's let's jump to sandy and, and then robert Yeah, two points I really want to bring forward. I really hope we can continue our discussion. There was a quote that's sort of relevant a little bit of what we were just saying about one one of, in terms of like what he sees that would would um, in terms of moving forward. Uh, and you know what is interesting in the book is how he weaves. Um, he does. He talks a lot about science. He talks a lot about biology. He talks a lot about anthropology, archaeology. He he has a lot of grounded material, and that's coming out of the Lindisfarne interface that he had. And he weaves it together, um, you know, incredibly artfully. But here's a quote that I think evokes, on some level, part of what he's doing and what we he feels like that needs to happen, which is the resacralization of science, brought about by an energizing of the old emotional of the old esoteric mysteries, and um, I, you know, he he does that with amazing integrity. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, so I, you know, I really do encourage people just to continue to dive into this. I mean, it's just so there's such richness. But one of the points I think is really, really significant that um, um, is his discussion around sexuality and the role of feminine and masculine. This is really a key piece in all of what he writes about in terms of looking at evolution, in terms of, of, of the shifts in, shifts in structures of consciousness and manifestations of culture really come down at the foundational level around understanding the nature of, of feminine and masculine energies. And despite some of his snarky uh, um, comments that can be really interpreted in some, you know, some like dismissal, instead his attitude around the feminine is, um, one of the last things he writes about in the book in terms of what he's again seeing in terms of the manifestation is about the new culture involves the recovery of the feminine the deconstruction of patriarchy and what his term of feminine is a really complex one that is rooted in lots of 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 um uh, manifestations that are very very interesting and really important uh so i really want to plant the seed here in this group to have a real focus on that topic, because I'm curious too in terms of Gebser. I'm trying to remember, think about like how Gebser brings in the dynamic of sexuality and and feminine, you know, the role of feminine masculine. Um, I feel like it's really important, uh, and there's so much richness here. Uh, so again, I'm not just planting the seed. I want to just like water number of seeds so that they all grow, but it's really significant. And I'd like to hear a little bit of you talking about that part of his work, Jeremy. 
Yeah, this is a great subject. I mean, my one of my favorite chapters of this book is is the last chapter, um, which really is a it's called the road not taken chaos dynamics and the cosmic feminine in the Tao Te Ching. And it's really a, a an argument that uh, the road not taken is is the path of planetization. Uh, another way towards the planetary and towards uh, the earth as a, as a planetary culture. Um, but th this is an, a, as you're saying, and he make, makes us a good point too, uh, when he's introducing Gepser for the first time at the beginning of the book, he's saying, well, Gepser avoided the patriarchal elements for the most part as well. Um, and Gepser was very clear about this too. The supersession of patriarchy is, is one of the conditions, one of the characteristics of the integral mutation. Um, and Gepser's own work on the cosmic feminine as a sort of principle that affirms diaphany. Um, I thought, you know, that line was particularly profound. So as I hear Thomson writing about Gepser, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing Thomson reading that, that line from Gepser about the uh, re-establishment of the divine feminine in terms of uh, our spirituality. Um, and the road not taken is very much, it's an interesting philosophical interpretation of Taoism as a sort of interesting cultural turn where we move more in, in, in Thompson's narrative, we move more towards the, the sort of Confucian geometric mentality that ended up being much more patriarchal. But there's this other um, more, matri let me call it matrilineal rather than matriarchal element in Taoism, which he's saying is this Taoist anarchic futurism in many ways that he sees as the as possibly the only viable path he could imagine anyway that planetary culture could go down uh and it's sort of it, it the book really ends as a sort of an open invitation to explore what that might actually mean um and i think for us today as we're talking about decentralization of nation states and we're you know the whole book is really about the decomposition of the uh, of, of globalization and the national identity and national industrial identity and uh, global economics and a move towards something else. And this something else is this road not taken that he talks about at the end of the text here um, that we have to try to figure out together. Um, but anyway, yes, I think this is a great subject. I'd love to hear more of our thoughts on, on that. And um, as much as he, you know, there, there's things to push back against with, with the gender stuff. Um, uh, Thompson is writing, I think, from a male perspective on uh, male bias on gender and the feminine, but he's also attempting to, in his own way, um, do right by the feminine, particularly as he's saying it's the future. Uh, so there's ambiguities there to, to hold, I think, in complexity. But any, any other thoughts on that, Tandy? Yeah, well, this one, I mean, um, in, you know, that question about how, you know, how do you, how do you get this information out to, you know, people who aren't going to read Gapser, Um and, and reflections about sort of how things are unfolding now, the issue of sexuality, I feel like is absolutely uh, vital. But first of all, everybody's interested in it. You talk about sex, they're gonna listen. And the dynamic of what's playing out around gender and sexuality is clearly a sense of the dynamic, like the, the what's being emerging as such an important, important question. So um, again, just another, I'm gonna plant, throw a lot of seeds out because I feel like the level of significance of this topic is not just, oh, sounds kind of interesting, but is incredibly meaningful and very important to be to be paying deep attention to. So great, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and just to sort of like one of the, the, the meta narratives of this book itself is I mean, he's talking about, and why I recommend it, it, it weaves so many things together, but it's also, uh, in itself, a narrative about the evolution of consciousness, how we got to where we are today, where we're going, what these meta themes or meta patterns are in the history of consciousness. And a lot of that has to do with the, the, the uh, depreciation of these earlier structures and their matri matriarchal or matrilineal association and moving more towards this patriarchal, uh, arithmetic and geometric mentalities, right? Um, literally talking about prehistoric sculptures, the body is a story of time. Um, from prehistoric sculpture to folktale to civilized literature, the hero versus the initiate and the masculine encounter with death, a comparison of Osiris and Gilgamesh, right? That one particularly is, is really showing that transformation towards patriarchy. Um, 
yeah, and the patriarchal construction of culture and the reimagination of the female body, right? So, so again, looking at, and you see that particularly, you have to really read um, the Ilgam, uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu myth to really get what he's talking about there in that transformation. Um, but he's really taking, I think, if you're reading Gepser and you're wondering, um, well, what does Gepser mean by the mental structure being more associated with with patriarchy and the rise of of, of the masculine ego, this is actually the book you might, you might want to read alongside Gepser in terms of that narrative specifically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so much, there's so much richness there. And I'm gonna assume we'll have another time to gather to talk about it because there's, yeah. and, and I would really encourage people to, as, to read this book and follow those themes. Um, because in terms of the role of the, the role of the feminine and the role of the female biologically is for him key in all of the major transformations that have gone on in human history. So it's very, very interesting. Not even human history, yeah. all of human existence. So very interesting. Yeah. And, and again, that, that'll extend all the way back to the evolution of life on earth. Again, in imaginary landscape, that's exactly what he looks at with the Rapunzel tale on this move from uh, matrilineal cultures, magic, mythic oriented matrilineal cultures into the more dominant patriarchal, right? And that kind of usurpation that occurs there. And then also a kind of fear of, of the old cultures in the old ways, right? There's a kind of um, attempt to contain those cultures and push back against them, distance ourselves from them, just in terms of the cultural narratives that take place there. Uh, so it's very much present throughout a, a lot of Thompson's work. Um, and on that point too, just the, the 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 self that he talks about here, he says all of all of human evolution. Um, to me, that, that was probably my, one of my favorite parts was his reading of Rudolf Steiner. Steiner has these really fantastical cosmologies about the evolution of of life and how, you know, at one stage of human history, spiritual history, we were like fish people. Um, but he, he deliteralizes that. He's like, this, this is not, we shouldn't literalize the imagination here. We should read Steiner in a, in a kind of mythopoetic way and see fish people as consciousness, you, uh, the human consciousness before it was human, right? Our evolutionary mind as it moves through these different bodies and morphologies across um, the evolution of the planet. And that's how he's able to kind of get these really far out there cosmologies to work with evolutionary science in a way that's quite grounded, but yet at the same time, fantastically imaginative. Um, so just la layering that in there too, but let me jump to Robert and then we'll do Francesca after. Thanks. It works better without mute. Um, yeah, well, so there's a lot going on in this conversation. Um, I just want to touch a couple of points, maybe. So on, on that last one, Jeremy, that's interesting. Just a thought experiment the other day. I tried calculating how many generations of human grandmothers I had. I think I came up with about 10,000 generations of human grandmothers. And I realized, well, there's hundreds of thousands of mammalian grandmothers that came before them and there was millions of generations of reptilian grandmothers and and so on and so you know if you if you play it that way it's kind of like what Steiner's talking about um you know but I'm just doing it from just a pure science standpoint I mean I'm not reading the Akashic record or anything you know just reading textbooks and doing the math um <laughs> So that's one thing. Now, on this other thing about, you know, I, I don't know if you want to call warfare archetypical male or not. Um, I'm just going to talk about it practically. For 10,000 years, being a dominating warrior culture has been an excellent business model that's paid off well. And so the world is governed by the, the inheritors of the most dominating warrior cultures, right? And there's some countries out there that are still trying to do that, you know, just read the news. I, I think what Thompson says rather commonsensically is that now that you've got nuclear weapons on a hair trigger, you know, the old brave horse charge, you know, testosterone fueled warrior mentality just doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. <laughs> um <laughs> And so whether you want to call that some sort of, you know, Taoist re-feminization of the planet, I, I don't know. But the point is, is the practical matter, warrior bands invading each other's isn't a viable future model. So um, then finally, I, I have an unusual space in all these communities around integral and metamodernism and all that stuff, because 
I'm a super practical person. I, I work in bureaucracies. I hang out with politicians. I traffic with money. I do stuff. Okay. Um, and yet here I am blowing off a business meeting for this. Why? Well, because what I just said, the old stuff, not practical. So the question is, I mean, I wrote an essay the other day that what maybe my project is I'm trying to invent a new common sense for the 21st century. Because, you know, look, here's a practical thing. So the question came up, how do we engage with culture? I may be wrong about this, I'm not sure, but I have a sneaking hunch that my mentality is Gebsarian, a perspectival. I just got a feeling that I kind of get it. <laughs> and um, now the interesting thing is, let's just hypothetically say, yeah, maybe I do. What you encounter time and time again in my daily work is that most people out there are still pretty perspectival. They're pretty linear, straight ahead. And, and I find, you know, time and again, I run into people where I, I say, well, let's do this. And the first thing they reply with is, well, do you mean this or do you mean this? And I'm like, yeah, I just mean it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, so the, the people just, they stop themselves in their tracks constantly with some sort of bifurcated decision. Well, it, it has to be this or it has to be this. And I'm like, no, it has to be kind of this. <laughs> and, but the, the interesting thing is I've glommed onto this organization that's building this really practical thing right now. And for some reason, the leader of the organization she can't articulate it, but she gets it. She understands that I see it, and she doesn't see it, but she trusts that I see it. <laughs> and so in a sense, I get to architect this thing with a bunch of builders that have no idea what they're actually building, but they're just trusting me with the design. So that's kind of, that might be a pathway forward. I don't know. I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of doing it backwards from William Irwin Thompson, and I'm starting with the money. And I'm working my way to Linda's farm, you know, with patrons. <laughs> so I don't know, for whatever hey, that's worth, yeah. but I thought I just needed to toss that out there. Sure, Robert. Thanks. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it's to Thompson's point that, uh, uh, quote unquote, institutions are more interested in these ideas now and, and are, you know, that that might be a starting place to actually kind of move uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, retro engineer our way towards uh, the future uh, to do a little bit of a temporal zigzag there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the idea, right? That the a perspective, a perspectival is, you know, as, as a rule of thumb for us, you know, there is if latent efficiency in the integral and a perspectival. We have to uncover it and figure out how it works and really employ that mentality and demonstrate it. But I think increasingly, you know, as Thompson was saying, um, you know, maybe a lot of us in our culture right now will need a lot of noise before they start listening to this new attractor, this new planetary attractor, a perspectival attractor, or the integral. Uh, some of us who are more hard-headed about the linear and the perspectival may need a lot more things to break down, a lot less foundation to work from. But I think there's a softening since Thomas's time where there is interest in that. There is, okay, well, you know, how do we think about our supply networks? How do we think about growing food? You know, the, these uh, crises become intensified and generate more of that bifurcation noise that he talks about in, in, in chaos systems, right? And the attractor dimension of, of the new becomes increasingly alluring. So that's sort of the, that path of allurement towards the new that's efficient, that feels like it has a better grasp on what's going on in our world and our reality. And also that sense that um, even the subsistence oriented sense that, hey, this actually will help us live through these times and navigate these times. They're, I think they're becoming increasingly attractive. Um, and so I, I think that the counterfoil institution like a Linda's farm, it is more like um, a latent evolutionary niche that's going to become increasingly important in an ecosystem. And the ecosystem surrounding it, the dominant culture is beginning to reorient around what's actually gonna enable us to all survive. So it's important to be, to kind of be that sort of Hermes-like 
mediator between those worlds. And I think Thompson was attempting to do that in his own time. And we are continuing to do it in different ways. And there's more than one way uh, for sure. But yeah, I appreciate your perspective here, Robert, on that. I'd love to continue to hear more of your thoughts on, on how that's going for sure. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, we got a couple more minutes. Let's let's uh, jump to Francesca. Hi, I'm new to this, um, and I'm, I'm I just learned about this meeting a, a few days ago, so I haven't read William Irwin Thompson. I'm just trying to discover my way through, um, you know, the um, John Gabster's book. So that's. <laughs> That's quite, so I've had a few experiences in my life um, that I'm starting to understand through Gebster's writings as to what they meant. Um, so my, my curiosity was back to the idea of the male and female and going back to Gebster, you know, the, the mythic magic would be more of a feminine. The, the rational obviously is more of a male period. So this new integral age, is it going back to the feminine? Is it a pendulum swing? Or is it something else? Is it an um, is it both male and female? A kind of an androgynous type of energetic age. That's my question. Well, that's a great question. Oh, and we only got ten more minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, the answer for me would be yes. <laughs> uh, in the sense that I think I talk about this a lot with Gebster's work and my own writing on this subject. The integral looks like remediation. Right there, we, we've gone so far out in one direction with the with the mental and the perspectival, and being as patrilineal and patri, uh, patriarchal as it has been, uh, that I think any novel emergence and unfoldment looks like like a snapping back, a reintegration of what's been broken off, a remediation of the magic and the mythic and the archaic, and a remediation of these uh, of the feminine, of course. Um, up to the esoteric, divine, sacred, and then also just in terms of uh, our cultural dynamics. So um, I would say it looks like that. It looks like a return to the feminine, but in a, in perhaps in a deeper sense, it's more of this andro androgyne figure that is revealing or demonstrating the whole human being, right? The masculine and the feminine, the left and the right side of the brain, knowledge and art, right? And that dynamism. It's not a static image of wholeness, but a dynamic one. And presently, temporally, it looks like the reintegration of the feminine as, as we're moving towards wholeness, right? A reintegration towards the whole. Uh, so that's that's always my my shorthand understanding of, um, in my own work, why I advocate for a remediation of the magic and the mythic as well as a really important first step to grokking the integral. Uh, and then also, I think very much why Gebster makes so much emphasis on the supersession of patriarchy and the restoring of the divine feminine as a major move of the integral, a major first move that indicates the um, return or let's say uh, the novel mutation of the integral and culture. And, and, and I'm wishing you best of experiences and insights and luck with jumping into Gebster for the first time. That's so exciting. Uh, I hope you stick around. Yeah. Yeah, does that make sense, Francesca? If you have any thoughts on that, I want to give you a chance. If you want to jump in, any? Uh, no, that that makes sense. I think it's it's both. Um, you know, in my church here uh, down the road, uh, there's this um, kind of um, itinerary priest who's kind of a rebel, and he's a great example of this new integral age. That, I mean, he's an artist and poet and blah blah, and. Um, and right at the top of this um, altar, right at the bottom of the altar, he has this picture of Jesus who, you know, that was recently painted by a, a friend woman of his with big ears and no mouth. <laughs> that harkens back to that magical, I don't know, what was that head from 40,000 years ago? <laughs> the Grecian head? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, gosh, I forget the, that one, but yes. Mm -hmm. You know that, and there, there is that picture in the middle of the church, and you flip, and it's on a little roundabout thing. It's like on a little pedestal. It's about this high, right? A foot and a half, half high on the floor, and you flip it over, and there's the picture of Mary. So it kind of moves back and forth from the Christ to the Mary, depending on on the day, <laughs> depending on the celebration. So it's both the male and female contained in one icon. So cool that's what yeah, that's thinking. fascinating 
I'm thinking it's pulling it's pulling that um, integral age. So. Yeah, and um, again, there, there's a really interesting overlap here. I mean, in, in this book we're talking about today, coming into being prehistoric sculptures, the the body as a story of time. Uh, there's, you know, Thompson talks a lot about gender, sexuality, and the body, and how it shows up as this sort of that these figurines are often very phallic on the one hand, but they're also very um, feminine on the other, right? So it's is it a is it a a woman's body or is it a phallus? Open question. It, it kind of moves back and forth. So there's a kind of um, you could read it as a, a, a pre differentiation, of course. Uh, on the one hand, you could also read it as just a, a, a different complexification, right? Another way of understanding the continuity and relation between genders that had it had its own robust understanding that we don't necessarily have as much today. Um, but when it comes to the integral you're speaking to. I think the the uh, reintegration, and we're looking for images that do that kind of play again, the play of the body. Like, is this masculine? Is this feminine? Yes, it's both. And actually, we, we revel in that continuity. I think we're trying to explore what the appropriate forms are of, of what it means to integrate the whole human being. Uh, and it's interesting that there's a bit of an overlay between what we were doing 10, 15, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, and also what we're exploring today. Um, in some ways, you know, a lot of folks, Picasso is alleged to have said this about the Lasso the, the Caves. He says, like, you know, they already invented everything. All the art was already been done, like, um, at the beginning. There is a sense of, um, uh, if there's like a wormhole of time, the, the deep past and the present are, are folded into each other, right? They're, the space is bent and the two kind of overlay with one another. Um, and you really get that sense when you read Thompson or um, even in our work here in, in this group, there's a sense that the magic and the mythic, um, there's so much overlap and similarity with the integral. And there's an interesting dance I think we all do in attempting to acknowledge that and also acknowledge the differentiation that's taking place here um, and what that might be and what it might mean to, to be both the same and different at the same time. Um, anyway, yes, thank you. That was great, Francesca. And uh, it's Saw some somebody had their hand up. So, is there anything? Any other closing comments? Are we good? Okay. Well, this was great. Um, I feel like this was nowhere near the amount of time we needed to explore Thompson's work. Um, we should definitely come back. I'm thinking uh, we'll come back about the dates. I'm going to be in in Europe for a few weeks at the end of June into July. So, I need to get my bearings and figure out how. The time zones work, um, but it's possible we might also be able to organize something without me for the next session, or um, and or I would love to do a follow up session on this as well as we continue to talk about Thompson um, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, great. Well, thank you all. This was fantastic, and uh, I hope to see you for the next one. And may the discussion continue. All right. Love it. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. Bye.